Any more? No? Oh, no. <laughs> wow, very good. And it was a delicious supper downstairs, by the way. Thank you all. We enjoyed it. <laughs> the next area of our uh, agenda for the town council this evening is reports and correspondence. <coughs> Each week, uh, since I've been chairman, we have a report from a town committee about major items that they've been looking at of late. And we feel that this helps keep the lines of communication open between the, the town council and the various boards that we have, and we feel that this really benefits the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. We feel that I will also pause here <laughs> as a group that is leaving the back of the room is probably louder than my voice, so. <laughs> and I know you wouldn't want to miss a word of this. <laughs> have order now. You like that, right? I don't. <laughs> I haven't broken it yet. Resounding. Tonight we have uh, Dr. Peter Rand, who's the chairman of the Conservation Commission, with us. And before he uh, says his piece to us, I, I would like to say two things. One is that, for those of you who aren't aware of it, the Conservation Commission is one of our hardest working boards in town. They have been keeping their eyes on environmental and ecological concerns for the town, and, and having done so, I might add, before it was in vogue to be an environmentalist or to have such concerns, meaning that they've been doing so for decades. <coughs> and certainly no one has served the town committee better than Dr. Rand, who for many, many years has, has led the work of this committee on areas that are of a vital concern to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, such as identifying wetlands, working with the Green Belt Program, working with the planning board uh, regarding uh, obtaining easements and other, and other uh, parcels from developers. So I want to express to you my sincere appreciation for your obvious labor of love that you've given to the town over the years, and, and uh, it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to you, Dr. Peter Rand. Thank you, Frank. My presentation won't be anywhere near as heroic as what we just had, but it may be just as wet as some. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do tonight, very briefly, in the five minutes that I have, is to just uh, uh, review three aspects of what the Commission has been doing. Uh, one of them I want to talk about is the, uh, the Greenbelt Plan, which I believe you have as an item a little bit later on uh, tonight, and maybe some of the things I can say here with this map might help you understand that a little more. I also want to talk about the Wetlands Ordinance that will soon be uh, considered by, your, uh, by the Ordinance Committee and uh, describe just exactly what's going into that and what the commission, how the commission's been involved in that. And then finally, I want to talk about some of our priorities. Uh, I don't work well unless I have crap, so let me just uh, bring this map. Try to just for a moment. So the, uh, the, uh, the Green Belt Plan of the town of Cape Elizabeth. The, uh, now, this plan has been updated in the last year thanks to a grant that was received uh, from the State of Maine and the Council of Governments and the Commission to update the plan. The original plan, as you all knew, started with uh, putting a pedestrian, uh, uh, pedestrian way between Fort Williams on the northeast end of the town down to Crescent Beach and the Sperling Marsh, and it comprised a simple, single, uh, pathway down through with some alternate pathways. It was obvious that that was not really going to, uh, uh, as, the, as the town developed, that that had left out some important areas uh, in the town to be served by a, a, a passageway that would allow the citizens to go uh, through areas we had defined from our natural resources inventory as important uh, open spaces in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And so it was updated. Uh, and uh, in the process, a few uh, elements that were not there before uh, were added. Uh, primarily, uh, access to some of the border wetland areas and farmlands in the northwest area of the town. Uh, some access here in the North Cove area and some additional pathways uh, between uh, Shore Road and Mitchell Road and up in the northern area of the town. Plus, uh, a, an arm that goes down the Lomas uh, River. I want to emphasize that, that these, uh, these are simply areas that have been identified as what we see as priority areas for the placement of, of uh, 
passes pedestrian ways uh, if the opportunity arises to do so. Uh, in no way, and I think it's important because someone will look at this and say, wait a minute, I'll go right through my house. Uh, these, uh, we are not saying that there's going to be any taking away in any way, simply that in these areas, if the occasion arises through development of subdivisions or through uh, the desire of, of citizens to uh, uh, give easements or give land, that we would like to see uh, those lands accepted in those areas. Now, uh, already, we have accomplished some of this, this route. As a matter of fact, the Conservation Commission uh, has obtained two lots in Fee Simple and nine uh, 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 easements along the route that I have brought in in green. And uh, uh, you can see those, the, the primary ones uh, uh, that we have are through the Stonegate uh, uh, subdivision along Canterbury Fields, Oxstone. Uh, Cranbrook, uh, the uh, Wildwood, uh, down here on Lake Nursing Home, uh, and Jane Chief's property, and then uh, the Great Pond developments around the Great Pond, uh, and so forth. Almost all of those, except the things around Great Pond, uh, have been a team in the process of negotiating uh, subdivision, and the permit process of subdivisions uh, with the planning board. Now, at the same time, since its existence just two years ago, the uh, people of the Land Trust, uh, which is working for the same uh, goals that the commission is in the town, conservation-wise, has picked up two other properties in Fee Simple and has now four easements, uh, some of which relate to the Greenbelt. For example, a 38-acre parcel over here uh, in uh, Wine Shanks development, crop property, uh, a, uh, a major one last year in the Zion property uh, down here off uh, Fowler Road. Uh, key one of the big ones, pretty simple, but it was about to go right uh, by the Oak Road at the end of Willow Brook. Uh, and on a turning point and put up here in the Oakhurst area. So we are on our way, but, but uh, there's obviously a lot of ground to be covered before we actually can link these together. Uh, in, in a way that people can actually walk from one part of the town to the other. And that, of course, would be one of our priorities. I'll just briefly pass from the, the green belt uh, to consider another thing that will be coming up before you uh, in the hopefully not too far distant future, which is the wetland, the new wetland ordinance for the town of Cape Elizabeth, which we see as a very critical uh, new tool in uh, uh, helping the, uh, the town to develop in the proper, proper way and in a wise way. We've been working with COG on this for about two years now, so it's not something that we just dreamt up the other day. It, the purpose of it is to replace the present ordinance, which has very confusing language in it, very poor definitions of, of the wetland soil types, has very narrow standards uh, that uh, uh, should be met by the ordinance, and it also it overlaps with the resource protection uh, zone uh, language, and, and all of these things have have uh, caused great confusion, I think, in the past few years. We come up with an ordinance that is based on a national model, so it's not something that we just dreamt up out of our heads. Uh, it provides reasons for protection, which, as we all know now, if you do pass ordinances, you have to have in those ordinances the reason of why you are uh, promulgating them. It, uh, it has wetland soils definitions that are very current and uh, I think quite specific uh, as opposed to the last ordinance. It provides buffer areas which around wetlands, uh, which uh, uh, everybody, including the state of Maine right now, is considering quite important, and it has much broader standards. We do still have some mapping problems because the state of Maine has just uh, uh, passed a, uh, a shoreland zone zoning regulation which requires towns to, to uh, protect lands around wetlands that they uh, have described in the town. In fact, they, they want the towns to put a 250-foot buffer around these wetlands. And we've discovered in, in several instances, we, we thought this would be a good uh, definition to add to our wetland ordinance. But in so doing, we discovered that uh, two of the wetlands that they described are, in fact, in farmers' fields and had no wetland characteristics whatsoever. And of the remaining four or five, there are serious uh, invasions of, of upland areas by the state wetland 
uh, state map wetlands, so we are currently uh, uh, negotiating with the Department of Environmental Protection to see how we resolve that problem. One thing I would say about the wetland ordinance before we get it is that we, because we have spent quite a bit of time on it, and uh, it is in some respects uh, technical and a little bit complex, that before we, uh, before we pass it on to sail the seas of the uh, ordinance committee, we would like to have the opportunity to explain it to each of you uh, in meeting together and so that you understand what we're talking about. Finally, just with respect to what the, the Conservation Commission's priorities might be for the future, we just changed one of our priorities. <clears throat> we changed it at our meeting last week because we have come very much concerned about the town farm property. Previously, this we felt was protected fairly well by the Jordan Will, and, uh, and we felt that it was certainly was being used correctly by leasing the land to farmers and having it remain open and tilled. Uh, and uh, lately, because of the possibility of there being some, some movement uh, with respect to the ownership of that property or, or how it is handled, we see a possibility, although it may be very big, <coughs> that uh, the conservation value of that land might be at risk. As a result of that, we want to make a statement very clearly right now and very affirmatively that we now would like to make the, the conservation, preservation of the, of the poor farm, uh, particularly that area from Spurlink Avenue down to the Myers, the uh, Conservation Commission's first priority uh, for preservation in the town. The second one being access to Great Pond, which we need quite badly because we have no real public access to Great Pond. And the third one being the completion of this uh, green belt uh, system in the town. We would certainly want to encourage the, the uh, council to uh, and do everything it can to keep increasing the land acquisition fund, which we see as a valuable uh, asset and something that might be used with other funds that might be raised by private conservation group in town to obtain land for conservation in the town. And finally, I think the Conservation Commission would like to invite all of you to a party in the Oak Grove at the foot of Willow Brook to celebrate the reconstruction of the dam that approved <laughs> the funds for last year. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Are, are there any questions <laughs> of Peter? When's it time? Yes, you're Mike, you're Mike. <laughs> when is the party? <laughs> the party is when the dam becomes reconstructed. <laughs> oh. Good. Good. My only question might be when you when you mentioned concern about the the town town farm property, you know, which is which has kind of elevated the status to number one of the of the conservation commission. What what type of things did you have in mind, or what what drifts had you been hearing that might set off those kind of thoughts? Nothing other than what was in the press last week, and there were some rather bizarre thoughts about what might happen to lands enough to uh, uh, really stir the blood of the person interested in conserving land, I think, in the town of Cape Elizabeth. I think one of the, personally, one of the mechanisms I would like to see, because I'm impressed by their effectiveness, uh, is really the uh, placement of conservation easement on the land. I think if you're going to save land, you ought to do it in the most effective way, in a way that won't be altered by subsequent town council single-handedly or by other means like that. So I, I would suggest a conservation easement to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, was the Conservation Commission generally in favor of the, of the Rachel Carson idea of the federal government taking over the management of that, of the, of the marshes? Well, that's a difficult question. I think we've been through that for many, many years, and we recognize the need of the town to, and the desire, certainly, of a lot of town uh, people in the town to maintain its own control of that. And I thought that the, the easement uh, system that was uh, used last year was a reasonable approach to that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's an easement. And they're very strong. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for excellent presentation. We're, we're continuing on with reports and correspondence part of the town council agenda this evening. And I'd like to ask my fellow councilors if there's any reports or correspondence they'd like to bring forward at this time. Councilor Jordan. I'll yield to the lady if she wishes. Go ahead. I have a couple of things that pertains to uh, high school students. And one is that uh, Bobby Dahl of Cape Elizabeth has been named to, re to receive the Gatorade Circle Championship of Maine High School Soccer Player a Year Award. 
and uh, he's senior this year, has 18 goals, nine assists, and lead to the Western Maine Conference in scoring the Cape to a share of the Class A state championship. We didn't get it all, we only got a share of it. I just want you all to understand it. This selection was made by regional media advisory assembled by the Classics Coaches, a national high school and college coach magazine. So I think it's worthy of speaking of, and uh, I want to congratulate him. In fact, I did the other day at the, high, at the high school hockey game. But And I have another one here is Karen Brady, which graduated last year of Cape Elizabeth, is one of two players named to represent the U.S. in an international hockey federation first junior women world cup in Ottawa, Ontario, on July 19th and 30th. The team was selected by the U.S. Field Hockey Association, followed by a five-day invitational camp December 27th and January 1st in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And also, so uh, we won't, even though South Poland feels we black men, and I'll mention that Sally Maxwell of South Poland also is in that same group. And so there's two from this local area, and I think it's worth mentioning where it's a World Cup championship. And I'd just like to pass it on. I think the students enjoy it, and that we recognize them, and I think it's worthy. You can see I read the sports page. So. <laughs> We we'll see you read Sports Illustrated for that matter. <laughs> Councilor Amro. Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to make a brief report from COG uh, and to remind our two members of the General Assembly, and I think Wayne and who is our other? And Phyllis. and Phyllis. Wayne and Phyllis, that the General Assembly meeting will be on January 31st from 4 to 6. And this is really an important meeting. I hope you both will be able to attend because. Uh, all of the issues that were raised at the sub-regional forums last December and November uh, have been uh, put together and we've come up with a list of 10 or 12 major issues and the General Assembly is going to be asked to prioritize those. Uh, and this will really lay the groundwork for COG for the next, uh, <coughs> the next year and, and beyond really as to, as to where you want the Portland Regional Council of Government to put their efforts. Uh, so that's going to be a really important meeting. I think there'll be a lot of good discussion. I want to make sure that Cape Elizabeth is represented uh, and that we have our full share of representation on mm -hmm. that day. Thank you, Councilor Amaro. Other reports and correspondence from any other councilors? If not, I have a few brief uh, reports that I'd like to make. One is um, that the Fort Williams Advisory Committee is still studying the issue of what to do with the keeper's quarters. Um, for those of you who may originally remember, we were going to have them at the January meeting in order to discuss the, the study that they've put into the uh, whole issue of the keeper's quarters at the Portland Headlight. Now that we have confirmed that the Coast Guard is going to be handing over the keeper's quarters and some land around it to the town of Cape Elizabeth for, uh, you know, in the future. Uh, they have asked for an extension and I'm sure that I expressed the will of the council when I said the extension would be granted because we want them to take whatever time they feel is necessary in order to come forward with the type of report that we want so that they can successfully complete the charge that we gave to them. So Councilor, uh, former Councilor Adams, Chairman Adams of the Fort Williams Advisory has informed me that he will let me know as to which meeting they will be coming forward. I'm not sure if it's in February or the March meeting, but they will be coming forward with their recommendations. Uh, their report is ongoing. Now on a related matter, we had a very interesting meeting on December 15th that took place at the U.S. Coast Guard <coughs> base here in South Portland. Um, Present at that was Councilor William Jordan, Town Manager Mike McGovern, Chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Henry Adams and myself, and representing the Coast Guard was Admiral Rybecki and Captain Underwood. And what we talked about was some of the specifics of the Coast Guard actually turning over the property, or as we were calling it, the keys to the property of the, the headlight, the keeper's quarters, to the town of Cape Elizabeth. On Monday, August 7th, 1989, the light will be officially decommissioned and at the same time, at the same ceremony, the keys to the lighthouse will be turned over to the town of Cape Elizabeth officially. Uh, the Lighthouse Preservation Society, as we remember, that weekend, the, Friday, the Saturday and Sunday, which is August 5th and August 6th, will be running festivities to commemorate the National Lighthouse Act, the 200th anniversary of the National Lighthouse Act. So Lighthouse Preservation Society is responsible for the festivities that will go on at Fort Williams on that 
that Saturday and that Sunday, and the Coast Guard is going to be running, exclusively running, the ceremony that will take place on that Monday, which will be the official decommissioning and the turning over of the keys. I really was very impressed with Admiral Rybecki and Captain Underwood in terms of their frankness, their candor, and their, their true, sincere feelings about this project. They're very pleased to be turning the property over to Cape Elizabeth. And I'll, I'll just mention the four, what I consider to be the four highlights of the breakfast meeting that we had out there. One was that the house will be turned over to the town of Cape Elizabeth by the Coast Guard in excellent condition. They want to really refurbish it such that no, no major renovations by any means will need to be done by us. As a matter of fact, I don't even think minor renovations will be needed. As, as they said, they have every commitment to turn it over in A1 condition. Number two, they, they did interject that they hope that whatever we proceed with as a project will be a first-class, high-quality project that will continue to keep the building in top condition. And I assured them that with all the different uh, committees that had been set up and finally with the council having to make the decision that a high quality project, uh, a first class operation that we can all be proud of, whatever it is, uh, as it turns out, is what's going to happen there. And I, I know they felt that that will be carried through in good faith from the town. Also, uh, he asked for there, there to be some, in some way a Coast Guard recognition, recognition of the Coast Guard in all the years that they've been at the Portland Headlight at the property. He mentioned that if there was a museum there, whatever form that museum might make, perhaps a plaque on a wall or one of the rooms dedicated to the Coast Guard and the almost 200-year history which they've had at that particular lighthouse. And finally, he just said that he was committed to keeping the lines of communication between the town and the Coast Guard extremely open. We left there very, very square, very straight, and he said, that's the way that I want to leave it. If there's any interference or any problems in the mechanisms of working this out, let's, let's talk it over, and I know we can come to a resolution. But, but this is the type of man that he is, very, very straightforward and, and, and fair and open. So I know we all felt very impressed by the meeting and felt very good about uh, an exciting day that's coming up in our town history this summer, which I hope people will, will be around to enjoy some of the festivities for. That concludes my report on, on the uh, Portland Headlight. And last thing I'd like to say is that we did have a chairman's meeting, which is kind of a tradition that goes on in the town. We have a meeting of the uh, chairman of the town council, chairman of the planning board, chairman of the ordinance committee, and chairman of the zoning board of appeals, which gives us all the opportunity to discuss items that are on our various menus and how some of them might overlap with each other in the hopes of strengthening communication of the town and having us work together more. So we're going to be continuing this, what I call chairman's meeting, as appropriate in upcoming months to continue this tradition which was started uh, a couple of chairmanships ago. So that concludes my report. <clears throat> if there are any others at this time, if not, we'll move on to agenda item 74, which is to consider a report from the ordinance committee regarding fish and farm markets and take any necessary action. And for the students that are in the audience, I just would remind you, in case you didn't know, regarding this process of the Ordinance Committee, various things come to the Town Council <clears throat> in terms of changing the ordinances or the laws that we, that we live by in this town. What we do is we receive them as a council, send them to this subcommittee of the Ordinance Committee, which is th made up of three members of the council, that then study it, come up with changes and recommendations, then report back to the council as they're going to do this evening, and then uh, some discussion happens and we set it for a public hearing, which is usually at the next meeting, and then it's voted on after the public hearing. So that's a little bit of just to explain to you the process by which we're in the middle of here by having the Ordinance Committee report back to us. So I'd like to turn it over to the Chairman of the Ordinance Committee, Councilor Masterton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a good thing the firemen left uh, early because our discussion on, on these ordinances would probably have driven them out. Uh, we are dealing tonight with three ordinances <coughs> and some rules. And the first ordinance that we are dealing with uh, has to do with farm markets and fish markets. And there are changes in Chapter 19 of our ordinances, which is the zoning ordinance. The first area um, has to do with definitions, Section 19-1-3. The particular, the first definition is accessory building or use. And there are some changes that we propose to make in that definition by deleting roadside stands as an accessory building or use, adding farm or fish markets that are home occupations, and adding temporary open stands used on a seasonal basis by 
farmers to sell their produce something that is movable and <coughs> quite easily perceived as a temporary uh, kind of thing. Secondly, under the definitions, we add to this section a definition of agriculture, a definition of a farm market, and a definition of a fish market. A farm ma market is sells primarily agricultural products from at least 10 acres of land in Cape Elizabeth. It must be located on, on an arterial or feeder street unless it meets the definition of a home occupation. 25% of the retail, retail space may be devoted to related market products, and those also are defined. Fish market is defined, which its purpose is primarily to sell aquacultural products, that is fish and uh, related products, caught by Cape Elizabeth residents. There are the same requirements as the farm markets uh, as to location and percent of space devoted to related market pro products. Secondly, so the, our first uh, proposal is to amend, make various amendments on definitions. Secondly, we amend section 19-2-2, which is uh, resident A district permitted uses. We delete roadside stands as an accessory building or use. We add farm and fish markets with various criteria that have to be met on front side and rear setbacks, off street parking, maximum floor area of 2,000 2, square feet, outside storage and displays, signs, and there is a requirement for planning board review and approval of a site plan. Thirdly, the proposal amends section 19-2-3, which is the resident C district permitted uses. We delete roadside stands as an accessory build building or use. Um, fish and farm markets have to be on lots of at least 40,000 square feet, and the same types of criteria must be satisfied, that is the setbacks, the off-street parking, maximum floor area, outside storage and display, signs, and planning board review and approval of site plan. In, finally, in both districts A and C, farm and fish markets meeting the definition of home occupations shall require zoning board of appeals approval. I'm, I have spent a little time on this because it's sort of a complicated um, zoning amendment and a lot of time has been spent on it um, by the planning board, by the, our ordinance committee, and by the town attorney and our town planner. So with that, I would like to move that we post uh, this proposal to uh, public hearing February 13 at 7.30 at the Town Hall. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to have this appear as a public hearing uh, in, in February, at our February meeting. Now, any discussion about this ordinance that <coughs> Nancy just eloquently paraphrased? <laughs> yes. I have a couple of questions for Nancy on this. In the definition of fish market, page, page two, letter M at the top of the page, mm -hmm. second line, well, it reads, a fish market that is operated pri primarily for the retail sale of raw aquacultural products, most of which are caught or gathered by Cape Elizabeth residents. And I'm wondering what the thinking was behind the wording of most of which, rather than quantifying that amount. You mean a percentage? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? 
Well, uh, we, we did want to emphasize that basically these would be lobsters that, are, that were um, harvested by Cape lobstermen or fish that were harvested by Cape fishermen. Um, obviously, when you're running a fish market, you might supplement your own produce, products with a little bit of somebody else's. Uh, percentages are very difficult to enforce. Um, we just felt that we would keep this general and not get too specific on it. It would be very hard to prove somebody else's fish. <coughs> if I could add to that, the, the other problem is, is that, that it's seasonal in nature. And at one point, it might be just 20% uh, local. And another time, it might be 95%. And it, that makes it particularly difficult. So what we're looking for is a general pattern that most of it is uh, coming uh, from Cape uh, fishermen. Which, which yes, Chairman, if I may add a little bit to that, and why the word most is in there is because you may have a relative that is a fisherman, and he might not be a resident at this present time or at that present time in Cape Elizabeth. He might be living in Portland at the time, and he might be a relative of the gentleman that's running the fish market and still fish out of <coughs> Cape Elizabeth. But he's not exactly a resident of the Cape, and I believe that's why that was left that way. Okay. Yes. I have another question. <laughs> Uh, looking at the minimum front yard setbacks, the requirement <coughs> mentioned here is 100 feet. And in reviewing the ordinance, I found that was consistent with the existing building setback requirements within the zoning ordinance. In the future, I would like consideration to be given to a setback for this kind of use of 50 feet. If you look at a setback of 100 feet, it means your building has to be 100 feet back from the property line. This ordinance allows parking in the second 50 feet away from the road. That leads you to single <coughs> loaded parking, which is one row of parking, and then your travel and your maneuvering aisle, which is not nearly as efficient as double loaded parking which is parking, travel, and more parking. You have to have at least 60 feet for that. If you're allowed to put your building, the setback is 100 feet. That's where the building most often ends up, in my experience. If you had only a 50-foot setback and had your building 50 feet back from the road, you could have your parking in behind the building. If it is a business, people are generally intelligent enough to realize that plenty of parking is provided, and it can be provided behind the building. You drive in, you go behind the building. In keeping with the residential nature of the districts that we're saying that fish and farm markets can be located in, I would find it more in keeping with the, that residential nature if you were seeing a building rather than parking, which we always say, well, if there's parking out front, we have to hide it somehow with a lot of trees or berms or some other means. So I'd like consideration to be given, not necessarily on this ordinance, but in the future to considering a 50-foot setback rather than 100 feet for this kind of use. I'd say talk to the planning board. <coughs> I'm working on that. Because this really came up through the planning mm -hmm. board. May I, dis may I disagree with it? Mm -hmm. I think most of your homes and what have you in that area has their parking in the front. We're not so, talking about any area. Oh, she said to be in compliance with the area and the district that this was in, including the homes, if I heard it correctly, or maybe I misunderstood it. And besides, <coughs> I don't think you should bring the building closer to the road and, and send all the parking to the rear of the building. I think it's a market and what have you. Similar to that, you your uh, <coughs> Palm Cove complex down here is, doesn't have the, maybe they couldn't at the time, but they don't have the parking, they have the parking in the front. People like to come and go in the front door, they don't like to go in the back door. 
This was all discussed when we put this together, but maybe in the future you should. But I think it's wrong to hide the parking in the back. Other questions regarding this proposed ordinance? I, I'd like to know, um, when it comes to, you know, we talked about, Janet talked a little bit about percentages of what food must actually be grown. Let's, let's get away from the fish for a minute and get into the food, the agricultural side. What percentage must be grown in Cape Elizabeth? Is there the same wording? I'm not sure. Is there the same wording where it said most must be grown, or is there any reference to what percentage There is a grown? maximum of 25% of the total building floor area devoted to retail sales. Whoops. We're talking, you want to talk about farms. Um, that all farm markets, including those defined as a, a home occupation, may be related market products, whether such related market products are stored or displayed inside or outside of the building. That is, um, up to 25% of the total products being sold can be imported. Mm -hmm. But what about the percentage of the other 75%? That is, I guess this means things like that, that uh, prepare to process food products, non-alcohol beverages, handicrafts, Christmas wreaths, mm -hmm. which means 75% must be dedicated to to food that's grown, that's fresh That's actually fresh grown on at least 10 acres in Cape Elizabeth. Okay, so, so where do we get into the most, like Michael was saying, at times of the year when it's impossible to have 100% of that grown in Cape Elizabeth? How far, how far down can you go where none of it's grown in Cape Elizabeth? What, what I'm getting at, Only I guess, Only 25%. No, but of the other 75%, which is the food aspect, mm -hmm. in the winter, that other 75% that's food could not all be grown in Cape Elizabeth if that's this person true. wanted to keep it open. So maybe, maybe none of it could be grown in Cape Elizabeth in the winter to keep these farm stands open year round. Maybe it wouldn't even be open in the winter. Mm. This is all but, very hypothetical. But to answer your question, there, there is no requirement proposed in this ordinance that a certain percentage of it has to be grown in Cape Elizabeth. And again, because of the seasonal uh, nature of the business. So if there is no, for certain times of the year, there's no percentage requirement, is there at other times of the year, like in spring does it kick in or summer does it kick in? What I'm getting at on the long run, of course, with this question is, is it possible for a person to open a farm stand, go to the Quincy market or the Chelsea market, I mean, in Boston, buy all of his produce, come back up and open a farm stand where nothing is grown in Cape Elizabeth? If they is that legal within this ordinance? As long as they have the 10 acres to support it and they go through planning board, site plan approval, and all the other could they have Could they have 10 acres not under cultivation, just 10 acres of property? No, it, no, no. there has to be grown, no. this is grown. on at grown. least 10 grown. acres. I'm just, I'm just very unclear about what, how much has to be grown in Cape Elizabeth and at what times of the year, because I could still see a person just you know, and, and what I'm trying to thwart is, is possibly having someone just go buy this produce, either in Portland or in Boston, and then have a, a very well-run farm stand, but actually where none of it's grown in Cape Elizabeth. I, I don't see the wording that blocks that. What, they have to have 10 acres of agricultural land in Cape Elizabeth. That produces. And, and it only produces for a certain season of the year. So in the midwinter, we're not growing. And so you might have carrots stored somewhere. And that which is produced must be sold in the stand? <coughs> no, there's no requirement for that. So it could theoretically be none of it would be sold in the stand. See, I, I've been on the ordinance committee or, or on the council long enough to understand that these nebulous areas later, later can lead to severe problems. And I'm just trying to, because, I, because my next question is who's going to enforce these ordinances? Well, and, and Frank, I was just trying to point out to, um, Janet, that it, it is impossible to determine what is being imported and, and what is actually comes from that 10 acres. Don't you agree? You could ask the person, though, so it's that they went on record. Yeah. It might be impossible to tell whether so they're So all you can you do can is, is uh, state an intent and uh, trust that the entrepreneur is going to uh, abide by it. That's about the best you can do. It's very frustrating. Then I still don't understand, I guess I still don't understand the intent. If a person can be growing on this 10 acres and yet none of it has to necessarily be sold in the stand, all of which could still be purchased vegetables in Boston and sold at the farm stand. There's got to be some linkage between what's grown in Cape Elizabeth and sold at the peak season or at some time in order to, to make this a truly- There has to be a purpose to the farm stand. I mean, you're not 
putting up a grocery store, a product store. You're trying to get rid of your products. That, that's the main mm -hmm. purpose of a farm market. To, to answer your question about enforcement, the codes officer would go out there and he would see, the, you know, what the requirement is the farm market has to be operated primarily for the purpose of selling raw agricultural products grown upon a minimum of 10 acres uh, of agricultural land within Cape Elizabeth. You know, so the number one requirement out there is that the code officer would look, are there 10 acres here? Uh, number two, is the 10 acres being farmed, or at least an attempt made at farming? Uh, you know, again, intent. And third, you know, isn't it, does it look like some of it's being sold in the farm stand? You know, you could get a case one year that, you know, some insect gets into the crops and, you know, that sort of thing. And I don't think the codes officer is going to close the farm stand down. But they are going to be looking for an attempt to, uh, to farm uh, 10 acres uh, in and around the farm stand. Councilor Amaro? Uh, I think we're getting a little bit too technical or something because I think we have to trust uh, the market demands. People want local native products and when they're available, farm stands are going to sell them because that's what people want. Uh, when they're not available, they'll be bringing in uh, vegetables and fruits from other areas. So I think we have to use our common sense and realize that farmers are going to try to sell what people want. And if there's local products available, certainly they'll be sold in local stands. I'm not, I'm not worried that that's going to be a problem. I'm trying to get blockage of someone down the road taking advantage of our law and simply opening a store and using some of this legalese in order to, to circumvent, which is a very prosperous business, which is to open a store in Cape Elizabeth. I mean, by just, just growing exclusively carrots or something, or, or just make, like you said, making a token attempt at farming in order to get around the law to be able to bring in the rest of their, you know, it may, it may seem like that might not happen now, but how do we know 10 years down the road what could happen? This, this still has to go through site plan review by the planning board. It's not going to be something that you're just going to decide that you're going to establish. Mm -hmm. And it would be a rather expensive undertaking if, if you were trying to circumvent this and try to run it year round. Okay. I mean, these, these are the questions that I have, which I still have. Council Jordan? That, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. The question that's in your mind there about somebody uh, setting up a stand there and importing all the products was discussed quite heavily during the uh, putting together of this ordinance with that committee, and it was a fairly large committee with fishermen, farmers, and what have you on it, and also lawyers. And uh, it was felt when we got done with it, this was adequate as far as curtailing somebody to do that, do the 10 acres and they should be able to produce a sizable amount of produce off of that 10 acres. Mm -hmm. Now, if they had 10 acres, like you said, and grew an acre of carrots, we'll say, and then try to import all their other products, I think there's language enough here <coughs> to not allow them to continue in business because they're not at least make an attempt to put 75% of the business, of the products that they grow through that market and buy, and buy the other. And uh, those same questions were brought up and fully discussed. And, and it's pretty doggone hard if you're going to nail that right down. So nobody can do that. And they've tried different languages also to uh, clear that one point up, and uh, we don't want it, I don't want it, and I don't think anybody in the town wants something like that. And that would be putting a, come under a market, like uh, right down the street here, Cape Fish and Farm, a full market, not a farm market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's interpretation again on the 10 acres. One thing that, that Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. yes. one thing that we were very concerned about was that a farm market might be, go up and um, uh, operated as a farm market, but gradually something like crafts would take over. And instead of um, an accessory, uh, accessory use of the building, 
it would become a business in a residential zone. That, I think, was one of the prime concerns, and we've tried to <coughs> work around that problem as best we can. So that the language says the market is operated primarily for the purpose of selling raw agricultural products grown upon a minimum of 10 acres of agricultural land within Cape Elizabeth. Then you can have 25% up to 25% of the total building area, floor area, you can devote to related proc market products. And those might be prepared or processed food products. Like in a fish store, you might have tartar so sauce or potato chips, packaged non-alcoholic beverages, handicrafts, and Christmas wreaths, Christmas trees, and garlands. And that is not an exclusive list. Mm -hmm. Bill, how, what, what would you feel about my, my scenario where a farmer is just growing one product, let's say carrots or potatoes or whatever it is, and that that's the product that they've got under t 10 acres of cultivation, which allows them the right to build the steam, <coughs> and then everything else is brought in? I mean, do, do you feel there should be any minimum requirement in terms of diversity? Like Kenny grows all kinds of salad greens, tomatoes, green peppers, you know. Th there's, there's a diversity there which, which causes a genuine farm state. I'm just, I'm just curious as to your reaction to that, in terms of diversity, the need for diversity. Or, yeah. or isn't that a problem with you? It's no pro problem with me at this point, but your scenario was brought up by me when we were putting this together, when I used another product. <laughs> Okay. And so everybody assured me when we got done with the language, which I don't know how many times it was rewritten, that uh, I wouldn't be allowed to do that. But uh, I still think I might. Yeah, that, that's the problem that I have with this ordinance, is I don't see why you wouldn't be. And I don't think that's conducive to the farmers of Cape Elizabeth, nor to what we're trying to get as our product for a, a farm market. I just want to add the 10 acres of carrots. There's an awful lot of carrots. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is nothing in this ordinance that would prevent that. Council Amaro? I move the question. The question has been moved. All those in favor of setting this to the February Town Council meeting for public hearing, signify by raising your hands. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item number 75, which is to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding proposed housing for the elderly ordinance amendments and take any necessary action. Action. Councilor Amro. Councilor Amro. <laughs> Councilor Master. Uh, I'd be delighted to yield to Councilor Amro. See, I'm trying to like spread to the work around. <laughs> this, um, uh, ordinance proposal deals with housing for the elder, elderly and it's, uh, it adds some definitions to section 19-1-3 including that a new definition of boarding care facilities, congregate housing, continuing care retirement community, elderly household, which is a household with at least one person over the age of 62. Housing for the elderly is defined. That is a facility uh, either which is congregate care, nursing home, or continuing care retirement community facility. Nursing home is defined. Passive recreation is defined, that is, leisure time activities that are of an informal nature, do not take place at prescribed sites or fields, and usually do not require equipment, including but not limited, limited to walking, picnicking, and hiking. We talk about passive recreation quite a bit in terms of uh, Fort Williams, but we discovered that we never had a definition of what it was. So we this will uh, be pertinent to uh, later sections of this ordinance. 
And finally, a definition on supportive services, which require at a minimum a central dining facility and meals program, a central recreational activities room and program, central housekeeping services, available qualified medical staff coverage, such as a registered nurse or a physician for at least eight hours a day, regular transportation services, and the availability of personal care assistance. Supportive services program are one of the um, elements of congregate housing uh, for the elderly, for elderly households and are an, a prominent factor in continuing care, uh, retirement communities. We are adding to section 19-2-2 um, in the resident A district, um, housing for the elderly as a permitted use subject to site plan review and approval of the planning board, um, we are adding to resident C district permitted uses housing for the elderly subject to site plan review and approval of the planning board. We are creating a new zoning ordinance provision, a uh, brand new one, section 19-3-15, in which firstly, for housing for the elderly, there are density requirements for congregate housing of six units per net residential acre. For nursing homes, the number of beds shall not exceed 20 beds per net residential acre. And for continuing care retirement communities, the total number of units and beds shall not exceed either six units of congregate housing or 20 nursing home beds per net residential acre for the entire site. That's first, density requirements. Secondly are site requirements. Minimum lot size, minimum setbacks, height of the structure, site coverage, uh, not more than 20% of any site's gross acreage, uh, required open space. Uh, at least 50% of the site's gross acreage shall be devoted to unpaved, non-vehicular open space, a majority of which um, shall consist of land that is usable for passive recreation purposes. Uh, there's a requirement for buffering, finally. Thirdly, we set up parking standards for congregate housing and for nursing homes. Fourthly, um, there's a provision for an elderly household occupancy guarantee that any facility falling, fall, falling under the definition of housing for the elderly shall be restricted to occupancy by elderly households only. And this has to be an express condition of approval of an applicant um, before the planning board. Fifthly, the, ap the, um, the uh, applicant must supply a community impact statement that is going to um, analyze the impact that the um, housing is going to have on community facilities and services and demonstrate that all new de demands upon them uh, by a proposed project shall be adequately met by the applicant. Six, uh, the planning board may require a market and feasibility study to make sure that the facility is going to be economically viable. Seven, uh, there's a provision uh, that if the elderly facility is converted to another use that um, the density standards of the ordinances in place at that time must be observed. And uh, the conversion would have to be uh, subject to approval by the planning board. Eighthly, the planning board may require that a congregate housing or nursing home facility give priority 
to Cape Elizabeth residents or immediate family members thereof on any waiting list for entrance to the proposed facility. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would move that we post uh, the Housing for the Elderly Ordinance to public hearing on February 13 at 7.30 at, in Town Hall. Second. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to post this for public hearing February 13, 7.30 at Town Hall. Now, discussion on the proposed ordinance changes. I'd add that this also has been hashed over pretty thoroughly by the planning board and also by our, our ordinance committee. That's Town right. planner and the attorney. Uh, not a question, just a comment. I think the parking uh, conditions that are in this proposed ordinance are much better than the last time uh, we saw the proposal. Big improvement in the parking space as well. I would just ask where, one, one of the key figures, of course, in this is going to be how many units per acre we allow on congregate care housing. The number was determined was six units per acre. And, I, and I'm curious as to be, what kind of conversation led up to that, or what was some of the background on that that, that drew that all important number, which I know developers will be looking at, people in town will be looking at. Why, why was that the magic number? Or how was that arrived? I don't remember that we discussed that that came through the planning board and the chairman is here perhaps she'd like to answer that question would you like to answer that alice rand's the chairman of the planning board if you'd like to come down i'd just like to comment first i think this is another three-year ordinance in the, in the wings that we have um that was arrived at through an evolutionary process of the planning board going to visit several um, congregate care housing <coughs> places, comparing the ordinances uh, that are available in the state of Maine and also outside the state of Maine to see what kinds of density standards were used in other places as well as, as in our state. Uh, and I believe uh, we started out with a, a proposal from some developers uh, who wanted to us to consider, I believe, 11 was it at the beginning, and then uh, we came down from that. We looked at Falmouth, which I think has five. Mr. Fullerham is here from from. Pardon? And uh, so that we felt that six was a very reasonable density standard to, uh, to set for <coughs> our town. Mm -hmm. And that, that varies again for multiplex housing, which allows how much per acre? Or multiplex is, I think, 2.5. 2.5. Did that debate, I think, when the last I left this debate, which was in the workshop that we had, was that a debate that, that took place in terms of whether to put congregate care under multiplex definition? Uh, well, it, all of this washed through <coughs> the zoning board originally, and I think that was uh, ruled upon as not uh, that, that really a congregate care housing situation would not fit uh, under a uh, multiplex standard. It would not be appropriate. That's, does, do we remember why that was ruled or any of the reasoning behind that? Uh, well, Mrs. Cogshell was, I think, chairman of the zoning board. Maybe she can give you the background on that. The original appeal by, is it First Atlantic? Was that the correct title? Um, was to have a nursing home uh, under a regular um, residence A requirements. We didn't feel that it fit the general interpretation of nursing home and what had been established in the past and that the only place it would fit in our ordinances as they were written at the time was under multiplex. Um, First Atlantic did not feel it was not economically feasible to meet that standard. Other towns <coughs> do have congregate care um, ordinances and that sort of initiated this whole process. 
mm -hmm. because it is a new trend in, in housing for elderly people um, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And we felt that we didn't want to be left with a big gap in our ordinance again, and that it was something that we needed to address. And, and while I have all three of your attention, if I could ask one other question to see whoever is, is, is the correct one. I guess this is, this is you know, very important decisions that we're making here. I don't take them lightly at all, and I, I think everybody can see the ramifications of what's coming down the pike. And at a very important workshop that we had, we said that we wanted to try to address these definitions based on how it would help to meet the health care needs of our town and of our citizenry. And what I'm wondering is what kind of stipulations we have regarding Cape Elizabeth residency requirements in these proposed homes. There was a fear that some may perhaps be for well-to-do people from out of state that would end up filling these as <coughs> opposed to those that are in our town, you know. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, was that you talked hear? about or? Yes, um, the very, I think the last thing that I mentioned. That, that, that is in, in the current <coughs> proposed the ordinance. The planning board may require that a congregate housing or nursing home facility give a priority to Cape Elizabeth residents. So the may versus, may. may versus a shall, meaning that the planning board may not, I guess, if it wishes, require that congregate care housing give a priority to Cape Elizabeth residents. Why, why was the word may versus shall? Because certainly that would let you off the hook or would, you know, under certain circumstances it could be that Cape residents get no priority and thus would take up no percentage of the home. <coughs> so, you know, th these, are, these are just utterly at the crux of the situation for me before I could vote on this. I think that's a good question, and uh, I don't know that I can answer it except to say that there probably are a number of proposals coming down the road towards Cape Elizabeth, and it may not be appropriate to uh, insist that uh, they fill it all up with Cape Elizabeth residents. Frank, the, the um, facility needs to be economical viable. And I think if, if you tie the hands of the management to the point where they have to rely on Cape Elizabeth residents to make the thing go, there just might not be enough residents that want the facility or need the facility. That is really tying the hands of the management. That's. I understand that's one side of the argument. Another side of the argument was presented, you know, at that, at that workshop was, what are we doing as a council or as, a, as united bodies to try to address the health care needs of our citizenry? Which may be a, a broader question, but certainly some of these definitions might begin to have that answer take some form. And, and, and I'm not comfortable necessarily with the form it's taking, I guess. Well, I would say that this does not attempt to address uh, health care needs. It, it addresses uh, living arrangements for elderly households. I think actually what addresses though is who can get in basically in terms of prioritizing uh, applications because you could indeed have the opposite problem of, uh, of an overabundance of people wanting to get into a facility and then we're in a position of whether or not it is legal to prioritize Cape Elizabeth residents and then we get into the definition of well, who's a resident opposed to someone else and that's why I my thought was do we have uh, attorney Leahy's uh, opinion on, on the very last paragraph of the proposed uh, ordinance uh, I think that he has approved this wording and felt that it was all right uh, so that we didn't question that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At any rate, this is up to the planning board to require. Any other? Yeah, there are any other questions? Thank you. Alice? Any other comments in general about the motion that we have on the floor? Just, George. <coughs> just one comment for with pretty much of what has been said, but I was one that uh, when I was going through this in the Ordinance Committee, questioning whether six units were for a guy to run a business and be able to keep going and run it high in his hands. There's no sense of, to even enact an ordinance and let somebody come in Cape Elizabeth and not be able to at least keep the thing going and have it flowing for some reason because they can't have enough business generated to run the operation. And as far as the Cape residents do, we went over that quite a while and how to avoid that. And uh, I... And I 
I think every member of the committee didn't want to restrict it to say shall be Cape, Cape residents. We wanted to leave it up to the management, as someone had spoken earlier, and let them make that decision. And normally they would do it. They're in business to want to be a good resident of Cape Elizabeth, and it's no different than the Viking down there. If you're a Cape resident and an opening comes, there's preference there for you. Okay, thank you for that. You know, further background into some of the problems that I have with this. Yes, Councilor Cogshaw. To just expand a little more on Councilor Jordan's statement, we actually at one time inserted a percentage that would be set aside for Cape residents, and we decided that would tie the hands of the planning board and possibly the developer a little bit too much, and there should be a little bit of give and take, and so we removed it on the next draft. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other comments on item 75? If not, all those in favor of the motion on the, on the floor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Passes unanimously 7 to nothing to set it for public hearing on February 13th. Item number 76 is to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding sewer connections into areas classified as wetlands and taking any necessary action. For those of you who have been following closely, you realize I will now once again recognize Councilor Masterton. This one is not quite so heavy, although it might turn out to be very controversial in the long run. Uh, in May 1977, President Jimmy Carter uh, signed an executive order, number 11990, which effectively prohibits sewer connections for buildings located in wetlands or in the official flood zone, as mapped by the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, we have before us three ordinances, uh, one relating to our construction code, one relating to the Cape Elizabeth Sewer Code, and one relating to the Cape Elizabeth Wetlands Code. It, is, it was a condition of the EPA grant for construction of our Southern Cape Sewer System and Treatment Plant um, that we observe this uh, presidential executive order. Uh, the Portland Water District is being cautioned by its auditors that Cape Elizabeth has not met this condition in its ordinances. That is the condition of prohibiting hookups uh, to sewers from structures that are in wetlands. So um, I would like to move that um, this, these three ordinance amendments be posted to public hearing on February 13, 7.30 at Town Hall. And I would further instruct the town manager <coughs> to prepare a list of properties which might be affected by the, these three ordinances and that owners be notified by mail of the public hearing on February 13. I'll second. second. We moved and seconded <coughs> to set the uh, public hearing for this February 13, 1989, and with uh, other specific instructions to the town manager. Are there, are there comments regarding item 76? Comments or questions? Councilor Cockshaw? Yes, I wanted to ask um, the town manager if he had already compiled this list and how soon the um, notification letter would go out, because I'm c very concerned about those who paid um, a ready-to-serve fee, and once this is passed, would not be able to connect to the sewer. Hope to get the letter out a week from today. A week from today, and that gives them three weeks before the public hearing. And if they've started the process of um, connecting with the sewer, would that allow them to complete the connection after the ordinance goes into effect? The ordinance will go into effect if approved uh, 30 days after it is approved. So that, okay. Are there any other questions regarding item 76? Council Jordan. She was first. Council Greenlaw. I understand this is a condition for the construction of the Southern Cape treatment plant. I'm wondering what kind of wording, if any, we have 
concerning any hookups that may go, any Cape Elizabeth hookups, the sewage from which goes to the South Portland treatment plant. And under this proposal, uh, no language is, is proposed to, uh, to deal with those. Have, are there any kinds of requirements that we have that kind of language? No, there are not. Why? Would, would that be grandfathered? That, I can't remember the date of when that sewer was completed. Was it before 1977? I think it was. No, the sewer was opened uh, in September of 1978, the South Portland Treatment Plant. But my understanding is all the agreements relative to it were, were signed uh, sometime before then and uh, before this executive order was issued. It bothers me with our <coughs> one town, one sewer system fee that we're not going to be having similar regulations for both parts of town. And I would like to suggest that we include wording so that hookups, as I mentioned, that Cape Elizabeth hookups, sewage hookups, that would have their flow go to the South Portland treatment plant be included in these regulations. Which, okay. Where it says mm -hmm. Southern, mm -hmm. say both Southern and Northern however it needs to be noted. Except, um, Mr. Chairman, um, the reference to Executive Order 11990 mm -hmm. um, does not apply to the Northern system as it was previously constructed unless new <coughs> federal funding comes through following this date that would make reference to that order. So we'd have to do some rewriting. I don't know what the ramifications of that might be, Janet. I think we'd really have to give some thought to that, consult with the town attorney. I appreciate your, your intent. And we, we can pursue it. Council Jordan? I d <coughs> Personally, I don't think you should uh, try to insert that into this uh, audience for this public hearing because I think this is something that's long overdue and it should be moved forward. And if they want to do that at a later date, I think we could stay on top of it and add it. But I understood as <coughs> my background is due to the federal money that went into this project is, is the reason this is before us. And uh, one thing that I have a lot of trouble with, and I'm going to vote to post it for a public hearing, but I probably won't accomplish anything <coughs> at the public hearing, but you can run the lobby in, but you can't run it on. Mr. Chairman? Yes. We, we do kind of have a, a deadline of March 1st on on passing this particular one because the auditors of Portland Water District are going to be going over their uh, <coughs> accounts <coughs> at that time and uh, you know the whole we could really get into an awful jam if we don't pass this now or soon before March 1. Yes, I, I agree with what Councilors Jordan and Masterton have said, and I will be voting to put this to public hearing, but I would then make a motion that we ask the Ordinance Committee to investigate wording <coughs> for including the Northern Cape system under such regulations. Mm -hmm. That would be appropriate for consistency. Are there other, other comments then on this item? 76. All those in favor of the motion that's on the floor? Any opposed? So it passes unanimously to set to public hearing on February 13th. Item 77 is to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee. Uh, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Could I make a motion, another motion on this one? Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I would like to move that we instruct the Town Council Ordinance Committee to investigate 
appropriate wording to include regulations similar to what is involved in this wording to include the Northern Cape sewer system. Not to get too technical, but I think that should be an item brought up on the at the end of the meeting. Okay. I'm we'll trying to insert it in here. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, but I just. I'll do it at the end of the meeting. Thank you, Councilor. I would agree with that. Parliamentary. Now, everybody, I'm going to move, move on to the next one, which is item 77 to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding proposed planning board bylaws and taking the necessary action. Councilor Masterton. Doing a good job. Stalwart, stalwart service tonight. Um, uh, the planning board has been working on rules and regulations uh, for conducting its business, and uh, the ordinance committee has reviewed them, and we put them before you for approval tonight. Um, there are sections on organization of the board, uh, board membership, and board officers. Uh, this is section two on meetings, um, when and where, and special meetings and workshop meetings, what a quorum is, at least four members uh, or associate members of the board, the conduct of meetings, um, and one interesting part of this is if a question of a possible conflict of interest is raised, and I think this is a good thing to spell out, the board, after discussion, will determine by a majority vote if a conflict exists. A planning board member with a conflict of interest shall refrain from participating, influencing, and voting on the proposal or issue that precipitated the conflict of interest. On any matter upon which a member abstains, the chairman shall appoint an associate to participate and vote in his or her stead. Um, there's a section on decorum and order, which the chairman shall preserve. There is a section on public participation, uh, the public having to wait until the chairman asks for public comment, and uh, when recognized, stating, the, his name and address uh, for the record. And um, voting procedures, uh, adoption and amendments, um, <coughs> procedures including agendas, subdivision and site plan reviews, coordination with others, the town planner, code enforcement officer, uh, town engineer, conservation commission, town attorney, etc. And um, applications, a section on applications. It is sort of a um, blueprint for uh, the planning board to conduct its business. So I will uh, move uh, approval of the rules and regulations of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. I'll second the motion. We moved and seconded to approve the rules and regulations of the planning board that we have before us this evening in the packet. I'd now like to open this up for discussion from my fellow counselors. One discussion goes along with my second the motion. It's a minority on the governance committee, but I think the minority should be heard. It says here that new item shall be heard by the planning board if they commence after 10 p.m., except the items related to ordinances or board operations or long-range planning. Now, I think it's unfair to have an agenda set up and have somebody before them, the, the first one or the second one, to take more time <coughs> than that was posted for them to have, and have somebody sit there and find out that he loses uh, his chance on the agenda. It may be short, may be long, but they tell me that the board can vote to do that. But I say, I'm an attorney and I questioned the town attorney on it, and he grinned, but he said they could do it. And I took by his facial expression that it could be questionable. That no item shall be heard. Period. 
by the plot, by the bullet, that they commence after 10 p.m. So I don't see that it gives them a chance to submit the rules or what have you to hear anybody after 10 p.m. Even though they admitted it there, and I think it's unfair, and they might have only a 10-minute presentation or something like that. But I was overruled at the committee, and they worded it this way. I just want to voice my opinion. So the, so the question then in summary is, is, should the planning board be allowed to suspend the rules, to have the flexibility to suspend the rules, to maybe take one, one last person, even though it's past that 10 o'clock deadline, they've been waiting all night? I, I agree they should be allowed to. I think it should say it here. This is what I said at the time, but I was told there's no way to say it. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, one, of, one of the uh, statements in here is that, um, that uh, the board shall abide by Robert's rules, and under Robert's rules, uh, the rules can be suspended at any time with the proper vote. So that is quite possible. Are they under Robert's rules? Are these rules here? Yes. Robert's rules Robert's are incorporated. Rules Does that make you feel any better? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I thought I'd try. <laughs> Robert's rules, in my opinion, Robert's can do, rules can do whatever they want. I don't know. No, you can only do what's in Robert's rules, which says that they can suspend it, I guess. Any other discussion or motions or anything of the kind? Councilor Greenlaw. I have a question about under Section 6 procedures as it refers to agendas. And it says, <coughs> item number three under agendas, prior to the meeting, town staff will make available to the applicants copies of the agenda. Copies of the agenda shall also be sent to all property owners within 200 feet of the proposed project agenda item the first time that item appears on a planning board agenda. I've had a number of people as with citizens approach me with their concern about adjacent property owners being notified when projects are put on the agenda. And I commend the inclusion here of adjacent property owners being notified the first time an item's on the planning board agenda. My concern is with the 200 feet. In some parts of town, you may be only be <coughs> talking about one property owner, depending on how the parcel is dimensioned. I think there are a couple of ways that this could be dealt with besides the 200 feet. I'm familiar with planning board regulations in some neighboring towns where it's property owners within 500 feet of the proposed project agenda. That's one way to do it. Another way is to say to the closest given number five property owners. But I think in trying to be responsive to the property owners that it's worthwhile to consider either of those two alternatives. Council Council, reaction Mr. That? Chairman, um, yes, during the discussion of this particular inclusion, we discussed using the usual procedure of notifying abutters to, of the planning board. But the zoning board is 25 or so many within 100 so many hundreds of feet. Isn't that the same procedure with planning board? We're going to use the same procedure as the zoning board. It's, uh, it, it's so many feet, but then, you know, and the closest is 25. As right. Well. So <coughs> that was the intent, was to notify, use the usual procedure, although it doesn't specifically say that. I would like to see that be more specific in the wording. <laughs> I would like to amend the motion. Yes, go ahead. Can I do that? That copies of the agenda be sent to all property owners within 200 feet plus the up to the nearest 25 adjacent property owners. I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hands. Any opposed? Passes unanimously 7-0. So now back to the main motion, which has now been amended. 
Any further discussion on rules and regulations of the planning board? Council Greenlaw, any further? No? That's my list. Don't want to steamroll this one through. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, then, of the motion of accepting the rules and regulations, please signify by raising your hand. Any opposed? So it passes unanimously. Thank you, thank you Councilor Masterton, for the four presentations. Item number 78 is to consider a report from the Planning Board regarding a proposed Greenbelt plan and to take any necessary action. I see the Town Manager has copies of the, the Greenbelt plan here, which you'll distribute at some time, I, I assume. Would the Chairman of the Planning Board like to make a presentation of any sort at this time, or no? No, I think perhaps we see the evolution Okay. Did you have any other comments as Chairman of the Conservation Commission? No? Okay. Yes, Michael? Quick comment, uh, for, particularly for the benefit of the public. In, the, your notes and your previous council discussion, you, you were planning to discuss this uh, at a February workshop. Beyond that, uh, we have had some comments expressed in the town office uh, from citizens that uh, they keep hearing about the screen belt and uh, then they find out it might be affecting their property and they weren't aware of it. So I would hope that out of your workshop would come uh, some sort of recommendation that the green belt uh, plan be uh, widely distributed, perhaps through the uh, Cape Core and through other methods so that the public is fully aware of uh, where the intended green belt uh, would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would someone care to make a motion then regarding uh, the future of this? Councilor Emma. Yeah, I would move that we uh, acknowledge receipt of the planning board's uh, recommendation and that we schedule the green belt plan. Uh, for our next workshop, which is on February 6th, as an item for discussion at that time. I'll second. Okay. Did you want, as part of the motion, to have the manager widely circulated? We'll just tell you to widely circulate. That would follow the Let's workshop. Talk about follow it. the workshop. Okay. <coughs> well, I just meant what its proposed location is. All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? This is unanimously 7 to 0, so we'll be discussing this further at the workshop on February 6th the basement of Town Hall. Moving on to item number 79, which is to consider a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to approve the use of Fort Williams Park for the annual Engine One Art Show on September 3rd, 1989, with a rain date of September 4th, 1989, and take any necessary action. I don't believe we need much introductory comments on this. I move the group permission. Second. It's been moved and seconded to grant permission. This is an annual tradition, a yearly use of the park. It's been approved by the Fort Williams Advisory. Any further discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor? Any opposed? Passes unanimously. And we are moving right along with our agenda. <laughs> Item 80 is to consider a report from the town manager on the proposed roadway improvement plan and take any necessary action. And I would ask Michael to make some introductory comments. Yeah, I'm pleased to uh, present to you the recommended roadway improvement program for the current fiscal year uh, through 1994. Uh, this plan uh, has been being worked on for some time. Uh, a tremendous amount of effort by the Director of Public Works uh, on the plan. I would like to uh, publicly thank him and recognize him for uh, all the work he did do in obtaining the various estimates and particularly in uh, looking at what our needs were and in coming up with uh, the different projects. Uh, for the most part, uh, the projects that are outlined in the report are essentially, as, as he recommended to me, uh, I did add a few, tinkered with them a little bit. We increased a few of the numbers, particularly in the later years, to uh, reflect some inflation that might occur. Uh, essentially, what's being proposed is uh, a program that will continue to allow our roads to be maintained in excellent condition. The citizens uh, expect the roads in Cape Elizabeth uh, to be, be very well maintained. And this report shows that the continuation of that tradition is certainly within our reach uh, with uh, dollars. The, during the current year, uh, we're spending, uh, with the exception of one major project, we're spending $180,000. Uh, this plan calls for spending 190 next year, 200 for the next two years, and 210 thousand for the, the next two years. 
essentially what it would do is a lot of the roads that have poor base condition uh, would be reclaimed, which is a matter of churning up the present surface and laying it back down again and just putting on uh, an extra coat of pavement. Uh, there's also proposed uh, new traffic signals, the first in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, first of all, the intersection of Route 77 and Spurlink, the South Portland one, it, there's actually two, two of those intersections. Uh, this is not discussing, not proposing one at the Spurlink Church. And in fiscal year 1991, to put a traffic light or traffic signals at this intersection here. Uh, in each instance, these would be traffic activated so that you wouldn't be needlessly waiting for a light uh, when uh, there was no traffic coming the other way. It would also help to uh, slow down traffic uh, to both of these very important intersections. Uh, beyond that, uh, funds are proposed for uh, a financing mechanism for the Shore Road Bikeway, dependent again on what the final cost estimate is, a report that's expected at uh, the end of this month. Uh, for a little bit of sidewalk work, for some major work eventually out over on uh, Shore Road, for some drainage improvements in Broad Cove and on uh, Waterhouse Road. Uh, and way, way down in the future uh, to do something about the town center in, in 1994 to uh, help with uh, the traffic flow here. With the thought, with no specific <coughs> one, but the thought that between now and then a, a committee uh, could work on it. Uh, specifically, you know, I, I realize this is quite a bit to take in, and you know we'll require a much study uh, by the council. Specifically, uh, what, what Bob Manley and I are requesting tonight is that you uh, you acknowledge receipt of this as a planning document, with the understanding that it's still going to come back to you for budgetary consideration, as well as uh, you know for looking at the needs as we move along. Uh, we are suggesting that perhaps you would like to have us run this by the planning board to see what their comments. Uh, might be on it, and th there is one project that, that has been discussed by the council before that uh, think that you might want to give us authorization to move, on, move forward on at this point with available funds, and that is to, is to extend the sidewalk on Shore Road uh, that now ends at the Chapel Road entrance of Fort Williams, which is the, <coughs> the first entrance as you, you come to the fort that isn't actually one the vehicles enter, but is one you can walk, but to take the sidewalk that was constructed there just this past year and to continue it uh, to the the main fort entrance. Uh, it is a, it's a little expensive on a, on a per foot basis because there is some ledge there to remove. It's more expensive than the customary sidewalk would be, but uh, we estimate that would be about 15000 If you approved it now, we could begin to coordinate with Central Main Power uh, to move some utility poles, and we could also get the blasting underway, so uh, we won't have any problem getting it done. Uh, hopefully before Family Fun Day when we have all the people walking back and forth to fireworks. So I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to have this before you and uh, look forward to 1994 when all the work is completed. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Quite meaty in substance if you look through this book here. I'd like to open this up now to comments by my fellow counselors on the Roadway Improvement Program. I was just happy to see that the town manager included extending the bikeway on Sawyer Road, mm -hmm. which we discussed previously in workshops. I'd like to ask the town manager, the bonding page, which totals a million dollars, what is the scenario by which this would be approved and worked into the budgets? The timetable. Yeah. The, the timetable, in what's been holding it up for quite some time, is the Broad Cove Road drainage project. Uh, there is one property owner that, that would receive the chief benefit uh, from that program, a, a resident of Broad Cove, Broad Cove Road. From that resident, we do need uh, some easements in order to accomplish the work. Uh, we are now in, I think, the third draft of easements. The property owner has had it now for about a month and a half. Uh, and I've sent them one letter saying, you know, w are you going to get back to me? And haven't heard back in response to that one. So. Uh, you know, just as soon as that's squared away, we can put the thing out to bid and we firmly know our cost, uh, then I'll be proposing the financing. But that is the holdup at this point, is that is being, I want to be comfortable with that, with that cost before we, uh, we put the project out to bid and find out it's substantially less or, or somewhat more and, mm -hmm. and have too much money or too little money available. So the first payment for the, the, the let, let's propose that the million dollars went through in terms of us approving that size bond. The first payment would come out of fiscal 90's budget? 
That's will, right. will this Just be part of our deliberations in discussing the fiscal 90 budget then? I mean, none will come out of fiscal 89. Yeah, it'll, it will come out of fiscal 90, but you know, no matter what, funds are going to come out of fiscal 90 because we already have a bond anticipation note. And if we, if we didn't pay that back, we'd, we'd be having to be paying the interest on that. So either way, it's a, uh, you know, there are costs that we'll be looking at in FY90. Mm -hmm. Yes, Council Master. I have three comments, Michael. I am delighted at this document. First of all, thank you for the glossary. <laughs> the terms, the definition of overlay, reclaim, coal plane, and crack seal. <laughs> I appreciate that. Copies available at Town Hall. Secondly, I appreciate the commitment to the bicycle path on Shore Road. And thirdly, I appreciate the commitment down the road to doing something about the town center, the traffic. Of course, if we have a light working um, at the intersection of Shore Road and Route 77, we are not, hopefully, going to have people tearing through our town center, as I've frequently complained about. Lastly, I have a question. Um, is this the first time you've ever done this? It was done once before, uh, almost to this extent, but not quite. And we looked at a number of other issues. This is the first time I think we've ever numbered the pages, though. <laughs> well, I can remember when I was running for office last time, and we were asked what our goals were, and uh, such a plan was one of mine. And I really uh, appreciate your carrying it out. Councilor Jordan. I'm going to insert one of those things so I can, you know, like a game show to see who rose in the game first. The person on the right will come up. Yeah, I, I, I respect your deferring to Councilor Greenlaw. He's being chivalrous. I have a question for the town manager about the extension of the sidewalk on Shore Road. I, I'm understanding it's basically an extension of the sidewalk work that was done last summer, or whenever it was. Is there room there, is the road wide enough for it to be lined to indicate a bikeway between the edge of the traveled road and the sidewalk? Okay. It, it would, if, it, if it did, it would be have, to, have to be very narrow. Uh, it, there is a, a little bit of a tight squeeze up through there. Mm. And you know, eventually, you know, we may want to push a little bit more on the other side and we might be able to accomplish it, but uh, it's, it's tight through there. I'm aware of that with the ledge situation I, mm -hmm. and moving utility poles. I think if anything can be done along those lines, I would strongly encourage it. There is so much bike traffic in that area going in and out of the fort. I um, would like to echo Councilor Masterton's comments. I'm very appreciative of receiving this. I don't travel all the roads listed here to great extent. I do travel Shore Road to great extent. And if there's any way to move that up to an earlier year, I would be very happy to see that done. <laughs> I know some pretty intrepid bike bicycle bicycles. People who ride bikes. <laughs> bicycles. <laughs> that, that's the word. Mm -hmm. Who are extremely uncomfortable on that northern end of Shore Road when you are trying to dodge the sidewalk situation and the catch basin situation. There's some really dangerous side sections to Shore Road there. As I said, if it can be done in an earlier year, I'd like to see that considered. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Ramar. Uh, I was just recalling the discussion several years ago of uh, building that sidewalk into Fort Williams. And I think one of the reasons that it initially was not uh, built all the way to the main entrance was one was the uh, the power line and having to move the, that but the other issue was to try to divert uh, people from walking in that entryway and hoping that they would use the other entryway for foot traffic and that would relieve some of the pressure from the main entrance I'm wondering if if we are indeed going to build a bikeway on Shore Road uh, when we do yeah is is it going to be complicated by the fact that there will be a sidewalk at that entrance? Will that leave enough room for a bike path? 
And do we really want to have both of those things at that one entrance? I don't know. I, I, I'm just wondering if maybe you want to rethink that a little bit. You know, as I, as I said earlier, it is tight. Most of the land al along there, where we're talking about, we own uh, across uh, at Family Field. So, you know, what we, c we can veer a little bit over in that direction and take more over there than, than we customarily would. There is one house there that, you know, we do need to be uh, very concerned about. You know, it, it is tight, and, you know, we probably wouldn't have a bikeway as, as wide as we would customarily have. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of pedestrian traffic there. We, we, we encourage people to go up to Chapel Road Gate by having it open, but you know people go out the other way because you know they they don't want to go up in that dark area not knowing what's there. They want to be in the the bright public area, and that's that's the way they're going. That I can understand. If you look at typical park design, people don't like to go in parks uh, in areas that, that are away from the rest of the park. You know, for safety reasons. Not that we've ever heard of anything happening up there. But. I'd like to ask the manager at this point, if, if you could just refresh our memories on what's happened so far in fiscal 89 regarding this particular account. Or how, much, how much did we appropriate and what has been expended and what's left? We've been expending money for the Sawyer Road project and for <coughs> the engineering uh, early on of the Broad Cove Road drainage project. And the balance is 37000 as I understand The balance it? in the account is 37000 Okay. There was 137000 in, in the account. Mm -hmm. But 100,000 of it had been set aside for Sawyer Road. Okay. Other comments or questions? Council Jordan. I'll excuse you this time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> See what happens? I, too, want to thank Michael. I think this is a great document, but I, I'd like to disagree with him in one place that the traffic signal that uh, spoke angle, I think, should come second after the one that. Sure, road. and I'd like to know, and I know the reason you put it ahead to do the accents. I would like to know after the road was reconstructed and the sight distance was better, how many accidents after that, not before it, after it. It was interesting. What happened right after the road was reconstructed, the accidents went way down, but every year it's been creeping up again to almost the point that it was before the reconstruction. Okay. So may maybe it's going to go that way, but I hate to see lights in Cape Elizabeth. It's losing its royal cap. And uh, the other thing was that uh, Councilor Greenlaw took my thunder out was uh, I'm in agreement with that sidewalk getting down to the front, but my point is, and it goes along with Councilor Amro, if you run it on to the main gate, then you're going to have a bikeway or a walkway up alongside the road in the fort because that isn't any too wide there, so something's going to be done there also. So if there's some way with some lights or a little something that could encourage them to come in the other way, it might be a little less expensive if it was fixed up a little bit and cleaned up a little bit, maybe if they had a light or two over there or something like that. And encourage for walkers, put a sign up there. We like signs in the Cape. Uh, walkers and bikers, here's this entrance. Because I really is concerned about the width of the road after you get in the fort. We already do have the sidewalk within the fort itself. I didn't know that. Yeah. But it's still pretty long, and the bikers would either have to go up on the sidewalk or ride in the road. Well, you know, maybe what you'd like to do is take a look at that in the next month and, uh, mm -hmm. in the next month and see if uh, it can all be fit in there. Well, that's part of our facility tour on March that's 23rd. It's a little late, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That was my comments. Just one comment in relation to that. No matter, you know, the work we're going to be doing, uh, removing the utility poles and the ledge, that would accommodate a, a wider bike path through that section as well as uh, a sidewalk. So, you know, maybe we can, we can plan with CMP to get them to move the poles anyway. At least get that much done. There's, you know, very little cost to that. Uh, so, you know, no matter what you eventually end up doing there, it does accommodate, uh, that action would accommodate uh, your, your ultimate decision. It would help you to get four feet for a bike path, plus the sidewalk, a four-foot sidewalk. On, on the relate, related matter of the bikeway, I know our town engineers are preparing a study. Will that be completed by a February 6th workshop, where a bikeway is on the workshop? That's the reason it's on the workshop. It is expected to be completed by then. Good. Any other questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion, if someone would care to. Councilor Amaro? Yes, I move acknowledgment of receipt of this 
five-year roadway improvement program, uh, and that we ask the manager and the public works director to sit down with members of the planning board uh, to ask for their input regarding that. Exactly. Is, was, would you also like to include in your motion the recommendation to do the work between Shore Road and Chapel Road? Yeah. That has been asked by the manager. The sidewalk? Mm -hmm. No. I, th I, I think all I'm asking, I was, but after the discussion, I think all I'm asking for now is permission to ask CMP to move the polls. Okay. All those in favor? Oh, excuse me. Do we second my hand? I second it. Any discussion on that motion? Council Cogso. I'll amend it to include the moving of the polls. Second. Request that the polls be moved by CMP. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment? Okay. Back to the main motion, which has now been amended. Any further discussion of the main motion? Council Cogchon? Is there some date we could set very soon for us to have at least looked at this general area on our own? so that we don't delay construction if we decide to go ahead with it before the, the crunch of the summer season. Could we say by our February 6th workshop, perhaps we all would have looked at it? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it possibly could be an agenda item on our February meeting. Mm -hmm. That's reasonable. At the regular February meeting? Yes, the regular February meeting the regular. to make a final decision on the actual project. Mm -hmm. All right, any further discussion on the main motion as amended? If not, all those in favor? Any opposed? So it passes unanimously, seven to zero. <coughs> we would now like to take up item 81, which is to consider a recommendation to the fire department board of engineers to establish a fee of $50 per hour for a main fire department vehicle requested for outside non-town functions and taking the necessary action. And I'd ask Michael to make a little introductory comments on this. On, at a meeting on December 11, 1988, the Board of Engineers of the Fire Department voted unanimously to recommend to the Town Council to charge $50 per hour for a manned Fire Department vehicle at a non-town function. But this essentially came about uh, out of the town rescue. Uh, we've always had the policy, for example, when they went over to the, the golf tournament that used to be held at Perpudic, or they were, they were called to the <coughs> symphony concerts at the Ford or something like that. It was always kind of understood that there'd be some sort of a donation. Uh, for, you know, the, the dona donations in some instances came in, in other cases they didn't. Uh, the rescue feels that, uh, as well as the fire department, uh, for the fire department vehicles, but I think it's more strongly felt by the rescue, that, uh, you know, that there ought to be a set policy uh, on these, you know, when, when there is a special request uh, for a special function. And that we, uh, you know, we ought not to kind of wink and say, you know, by the way, a donation is expected. You know, th there is absolutely no hint, there's no thought at all that this would in any way lead towards other charges for the rescue. Uh, it's it's only for those when rescue members are to are more or less asked, they they have volunteers, that you have to be at an event at a certain time from a certain hour to a certain hour. Uh, a private ambulance service for this would charge probably three times what's recommended here. Uh, you know, we are looking at having, uh, in this instance, with the rescue, it's always like four EMTs uh, on the rescue. Uh, they, they, you know, I think do want to emphasize, though, that, you know, they, they don't see this as, as the, as, you know, charging fees for their regular services, and they, they you know, would uh, very much be opposed to any suggestion uh, that that, that uh, type of a fee be placed. Thank you. Discussion of item 81, which is now before us. Yes, I have a, <coughs> a couple of comments because uh, I am opposed to this. Where does the money go once you get it? This will go into the general fund. So the people that attend those functions are going to get any more money they do now, is that correct? Yes, the fire personnel are in fact paid uh, for when they go to these events, and this would be recovery <coughs> of our costs for them. The rescue members would continue uh, not to be paid. And the, but yet the funds would still go into the general fund. So other than uh, some gas and oil and a little, and some wear and tear on the vehicles, actually all the town, that's all the town's really giving up. Is that correct? For the rescue? 
in any it's no, for the, fire, for the fire department, we're actually paying the personnel. No, that isn't the right question. Other, all the town is giving up is gas and oil and maintaining the vehicle because the money's coming back to the general fund. Is that correct? Yeah, you're also risking yeah. liability of your of your individuals involved and uh, premiums and a variety of other cascading uh, fees. And you're paying salaries to the... Just not to the rescue, but to not, the fire Not department. to the rescue, but you're paying salary to the fire department. Well, I, I just feel that it's just a start of charging fees for one thing, and then it's going to snowball into other things down the road. And I always thought this town had a pretty good relation of volunteering some services that uh, when people come and want to some functions in Cape Elizabeth. And at the golf tournament, I think they were very good to the fire and rescue. Now, the other one that I would see now is the Portland Symphony Orchestra when they come to the fort. Now, is that something that uh, <coughs> they haven't been doing as far as a gift or anything to anybody, uh, any unit that attends that function for them? That's correct. Uh, donations have been suggested and they've not been received. So is this something that we're, in a sense, the way I look at it, we're pointing a finger at? No, is I, a certain group? No, there, there were some other instances that, you know, I, I don't want to embarrass anyone and I'd rather not... Uh, well, embarrass them, I mean, so you can well, them out. I think, you know, the, the Inn by the Sea requested certain services, not, excuse me, the Crescent Beach Inn, uh, prior to the Inn by the Sea requested certain services and had said they were going to make a, a donation. Uh, you know, I think when, when people look to us for, uh, you know, burning of buildings, they're saving a substantial cost. And certainly while, you know, we want some of those for drills, and we, we, we might not, uh, you know, if it's, you know, more so that, you know, we looked for the building, sought it, and burned it, uh, you know, we wouldn't charge. But if it's someone that's just looking to avoid dumpage fees and uh, demolition fees, you know, this would be, we'd look toward this and say, you know, it's going to cost we figured out that the uh, cost is about such and such. We would appreciate this, and this is essentially what our cost would be. And when we do those things, uh, we ought to recover our cost. Well, I, I don't know if you'd recover it. As far as the Crescent Bay Chain, there was a training exercise at two to three times, and then the fire department finished it off. And I'll admit they were going to send a donation, and they never come through with it, but I don't know just who you'd blame for that. And uh, there's another function that I don't know if it still goes on. Possibly uh, Council Creamer can come in on it. In the past, the fire company used to take a vehicle down where Broad Code had their kind of association and a banquet and give uh, the kiddies a ride on the old fire truck. We don't charge them 50 bucks. We would never charge for anything like that, no. Well, then why? This is what you're saying in this room. That's a not town related incident, in my opinion. Yeah. If you mention in the, the PS down below, it, it does exclude such things as parades. And, that is you know, that is in a parade. Uh, special events. Well, it's, well, it's you know, it's parades, special events, etc. There's no intent at all. You know, it, it's when someone calls up and wants to use the fire department for some, particularly for something else that they would otherwise have to pay for if it wasn't for the good graces of the town of Cape Elizabeth. They would have to get the service from someone else and pay a fee for it. That's the difference. Okay, then who's going to pay for the fire truck when LP goes off? He's down in the back. He'll probably run the camera in a few minutes because I see him real early to get in a training session. When uh, he, the fire truck is usually over there, protection of the fireworks being set off as far as fires go. And now uh, is that a requirement of the PSO? because they want fireworks, or is that up to LP to supply the protection for that? That is something that we would work out with the Portland Symphony Orchestra. We, we have, for that particular event, we do not have a, a relationship uh, with Mr. Murray. He is a subcontractor of the symphony. So, you know, we don't work with subcontractors. We work with uh, the principal uh, leasing of uh, using agent. Council Crowley. Michael, can you possibly convey to us precisely um, what the philosophy was of the unanimous 10 to 10 to nothing recommendation of the 
uh, Board of Engineers of the Fire Department regarding this uh, institution of a $50 an hour fee? I think the philosophy was that uh, you know, it, it's tough to speak for, for others. You know, this did come from them. It, it was not as, I didn't ask them to consider this. It, it, it came from, uh, you know, from the men within the department or the, the personnel within the department. Uh, I think the philosophy is that, you know, they, they, they you know, the words seem a little strong. They felt like they were being used. And I, and I think those words are strong. And, you know, and I, I really don't think that's their feeling. But that's essentially it, that, um, you know, if there are these special events and they're getting called to them and they're expected to stay there, you know, they do feel as though uh, the town ought to recover its cost. Uh, you know, maybe it, it isn't doing it so much in the rescue, but, but uh, I think it was the feeling of the rescue that they didn't... Uh, feel comfortable that, you know, they were expected to be there to give their evenings and, you know, that these groups uh, should get off scot-free. Uh, it was one thing, you know, there's no way anyone would ever be charged if, you know, someone broke their ankle at one of these events and, you know, that's, you know, no way we'd ever charge for anything like that. Uh. Councilor Masterton. Uh, um, will you finish, Councilor? No, I, 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 I think that helps me. Okay. Um, why? Would the fifty dollars for the rescue unit go into the general fund? Why wouldn't it go into their their donation kitty? Because of the wear and tear in the vehicles, the uh, the um, you know, I think as Councilor Creelman indicated, uh, the uh, spreading out of the town liability. We're responsible for the workers' comp. You know, if anyone should get hurt. Is this customary in other towns that a fee is charged for such services? I, I, I didn't do a specific survey uh, of the towns, and I don't believe that uh, the fire department personnel did. I'm not sure. It's customary in Portland. I mean, it, it's, it kind of some parallels our police. That when, we, when someone wants a policeman there, and I know that, you know, like obviously it's a grand example, but at the expo when I need a policeman and a fireman, I pay for the fireman, I pay for the policeman. There's some parallels that can be drawn to that. And we certainly have already precedent within our town to charge for policemen if they're being asked to be in an event. And I just see this as an extension of that. But that's, that's my own opinion. Yes, Council Jordan. Well, I think that... Uh in the past, if the PSO had a function over there, I think there was a little bit of an agreement on the unit to be there and be available if something happened due to the possibility of traffic problems. Now, <clears throat> I'm afraid what you're going to lead into, and I don't think it's the right direction to head. Instead of them paying the 50 bucks an hour to have them sit over there, they'll use it on response instead of having them there available. They'll wait. If they need it, they'll call them up and have them there unless you're going to make a requirement that they do have them there, and then you charge them 50 bucks an hour. I don't think it's right. For, for any large event, we review the public safety needs, and, and we outline what equipment's going to be there. Obviously, there's firework. They have to have a, you know, one piece of fire apparatus. And any large event in the fort, particularly with the poor lighting there, uh, after dark, uh, we always have uh, required that the rescue be there. And they have been used a few times. Do you consider the odd show of engine run a town function? Yes, I do. Why, why do you consider it that way? It's, it's one of the companies of, of the fire department. It's, it's one of these special events. Uh, you know, the people are down there, and the, the truck is on display with them. Uh, it's part of the, the scenery. And, it, you know, the, the main reason the truck is there for the art show is because all their personnel are there, and there's a fire, they've, they've got to go with the truck. It's a lot easier than running down to the station. <laughs> it's for the generator to make the coffee and stuff for the sandwiches. Is that what it's for, Joe? They I looked for coffee last year, and they didn't have any. Well, they slipped out, but that was the original. Any further uh, discussion? But I call it a special event for an outside. That isn't a town relay. That's a company function. I like it. But we wouldn't charge them. Okay. Counselor. So you're going to pick and choose your people, and that's what I say is wrong. Councilor Coxell? No, I was just going to move the question. Okay, the question has been moved thus. Have we had a motion, by the way? No, no, there right, is we'll no. Let's have a motion. I'll move that we consider the recommendation of the Cape Elizabeth uh, Fire Department Board of Engineers to establish a fee of $50 per hour for a manned fire department vehicle 
requested for outside non-town functions and take any necessary action, and this would be understood to uh, not apply to activities involving other fire departments such as parades, special events, uh, mutual aid, etc. I'll second. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Any opposed? It passes six to one with Councilor Jordan in opposition. Item number 82 is to consider a request from the U.S. Department of Justice to contribute our share of seized assets from drug traffickers, an amount of approximately $650, back to the Bureau of Intergovernmental Drug Enforcement to be utilized for continual drug enforcement activities in Cumberland County. Michael. I, I think this is fairly evident from the agenda item. Uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, council donated some funds to the Cumberland County Co Cocaine Task Force. As a result of that investment, the community made the uh, the task force did seize uh, some property under the federal law. Uh, you know, they're, they're obligated to give that back. As you saw in your packet, there's a letter uh, there uh, from the gentleman who now runs it saying, uh, would Cape Elizabeth be nice enough to uh, forfeit its $650 uh, share that get back about $650 and uh, continue to invest in, to use that money to invest in uh, drug enforcement activities in the county. And uh, I place this on the agenda with the thought that uh, you might like to take such an action. Just for clarification, is the cocaine task force now called the Bureau of Intergovernmental Drug Enforcement, or what? What, yes, what it bureaucratically is. is going on here? That's that's what bureaucratically has occurred. Uh, they've changed the name, I think, uh, because it doesn't just relate to cocaine, and uh, it's not uh, strictly limited to Cumberland County. And it's you know these things, uh, drugs go over, you know. With, with future line. seizures and sales resulting in cash probably follow the same path, we might, we might be asked, you know, time and again to, I'm just, just curious, in terms of procedure, do you think this is going to arise again or was this a one time? I'm not familiar enough uh, with the federal law to know how far our original cash investment goes. Uh, you know, I, I, I trust the U.S. Attorney's Office will we'll follow the law and understand it better than I do. Uh, but, you know, I, I think you, you ought to make it clear that, you know, if in fact there may be some, some downside uh, or some upside uh, revenue coming, that uh, you not consider this a precedent. You consider each one on an individual basis. Okay. I wouldn't want you to give up a million dollars if that should That's, I'm come just, my way. I'm just curious as to what could happen here in the future. Would anyone care to make a motion? Could I ask one question oh, for some certainly. clarification? <laughs> uh, our particular investment in this uh, was, I understand Chief Pickering was a member of this task force. He represented Cape Elizabeth. Is that where our uh, allocation is uh, coming from? Or We actually gave some cash. I see. Uh, he, he endorsed it. Uh, mm -hmm. The task force was made up of various representatives. We, at one point, tried to donate some personnel, and it didn't work because of long. It was, the original plan was personnel like for every six weeks and you know that didn't work because someone would get involved in the middle of something and transfer back out so they really encouraged after after a while uh, cash investments mm -hmm. uh, from particularly the smaller communities that couldn't devote someone full-time for you if there's no further comment would someone care to make a motion I move that we um, respond to this request for $650 to be returned to um, the Cumberland County Cocaine Task Force, or whatever its new in name is, uh, in this one in instance. It's been so moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yes, Councilor Greenlaw. I have a question to direct to the manager of this. I'm wondering if this has any kind of effect on county taxes. <laughs> now we're really <laughs> into the nitty gritty. Uh, this this is a, a program of the federal government at this point and not a program of the county government. So I, I don't believe it has any effect. Okay, I was confused when I said Cumberland County Task Force. That was That's geographic and not bureaucratic. Any comment Thank from you. our Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee <laughs> member? 
due to the size of the budget and the assessment to Cape Elizabeth, I don't believe that it would uh, make a tremendous difference, even if it was, but I don't believe it is tied with the county budget or the county county. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Seven to zero to return the six hundred and fifty dollars. We have item number eighty-three, which is to consider approving a quick claim deed in order to clear the title of land at thirty few thirty-five Highview Road and take any necessary action. Michael. Uh, apparently, this is is a matter uh, that there was some liens filed back around nineteen seventy and seventy-one. The taxes were paid, but the, the discharges were never sent to the registry because these folks who own this property have been you know, loyal, good taxpayers for, for many years, and we do not have a record of an outstanding balance. So I would uh, uh, ask that you authorize me to execute the quit claim deed. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Any opposed? It passes unanimously, <coughs> seven to zero. Approve the quick claim deed. Mr. Chairman, yes. I just wanted to ask a question of the manager before we tore into a vote there. Um, is the establishment of the computer system going to perhaps delay, prevent any further delays such as this? So in the future we won't be having this kind of a problem that goes on for about 18 years. And is that going to help? I, I would hope so, but I, I, I never uh, <laughs> give such guarantees. Uh, but I, I certainly would hope so. How did this finally um, come to the forefront? It was a title search. I believe the property is being sold by the current owner. OK. <coughs> is that right, Deb? Yes. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Pizzo uh, now handles liens. <laughs> <laughs> Her microphone is on. See, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> OK, we have item number 84, which is to approve the annual warrant for prosecuting unlicensed dog owners dog owners and keepers and take any necessary action. This is also known as the annual dog warrant. We are talking about unlicensed dogs, <laughs> not unlicensed dog owners. Unlicensed dogs, correct. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I read my cue card and I shouldn't have. <laughs> I properly read my cue card. Uh, would someone care to make a motion? on accepting the dog uh, warrant. Councilor Hammer. I move approval of the annual dog warrant. I'll second it. <laughs> it has <laughs> been moved and seconded <laughs> to prosecute about. unlicensed dog, <laughs> dogs. <laughs> Owners and keepers. Owners, keepers, and anyone else that violates the laws of Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, any comments regarding this? <laughs> Councilor Creelman. Yes, I'd like to make actually a couple of comments. I hope this doesn't uh, uh, turn me into a, uh, uh, a moaner and a groaner, but I do think it's an excellent time uh, to remind uh, the citizens of Chapter 7 in our ordinance tome uh, entitled Dogs. Uh, in my opinion, there are four kinds of dog owners in Cape Elizabeth. There is the uh, responsible dog owner with, with friendly dogs. There's the responsible dog owner with unfriendly dogs. The uh, irresponsible dog owner uh, with a friendly or uh, unfriendly dog. And I'd like to uh, address a couple of comments to the irresponsible dog owner uh, who possesses an unfriendly dog. Uh, the purpose of the ordinance is to control dogs throughout the town of Cape Elizabeth in the interest of the health, uh, safety, and general welfare uh, of its residents. Um, there is a very small, uh, I think, but significant uh, number of irresponsible dog owners in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, this is based on personal experience, uh, as well as several conversations with the uh, dog control officer. And, and the problem usually lies in Section 71C, involving at-large dogs in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, at-large dogs shall mean off the premises of the owner and not controlled by a leash, cord, or chain, not more than eight feet in length or otherwise controlled by the owner or an agent of the owner unless on other premises by permission of the owner or occupant thereof. 
Um, I personally have encountered a variety of problems jogging uh, on the streets of Cape Elizabeth, uh, sometimes with, sometimes without my own dog leashed. Uh, and several citizens have discussed this issue with me who also have found themselves in circumstances where unfriendly dogs are at large and uh, threatening them, if not on occasion having uh, bitten them. So I do take this opportunity at the uh, time of the year where we uh, look at the warrant uh, for prosecuting unlicensed dog owners slash keepers in that the uh, dog owners that uh, perhaps go unnamed uh, take this responsibility of controlling uh, their dogs seriously, uh, thus improving the safety and general welfare of all of the uh, residents uh, of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on item number 84? If not, all those in favor of item 84? Any opposed? Item 85 is to consider entering into executive session to discuss several personnel matters and negotiations relating to the Rachel Carson Wildlife Refuge and take any necessary action. So moved. I'll second. Been moved and seconded to enter into executive session for two purposes to discuss several personnel matters and to discuss negotiations relating to the Rachel Carson Wildlife Refuge. Councilor Jordan. Okay, so we're going to an executive session and then we're going to uh, uh, readjourn. Then we'll come finish back. the agenda. Back. Now, are the camera people going to have to wait for us to get out of there or are you going to let them go at this point? Depends on. There's further agenda items. There's further agenda items, including what we're going to be deciding in executive session. So there will be possibly some matters of substance voted on later, if the camera people could stay. We would, <laughs> there's a bonus in store? I don't know, whatever. <laughs> it won't be that late. It won't be that late. You don't think so? Or if one okay. of them could stay. Or if one of them could stay. But the, uh, and regardless, a few people could talk amongst yourselves. There will be matters of substance voted on after we come out of executive session. So we would appreciate it if you could. Okay, the main reason I brought it up, I wanted to make sure Councilor Greenlaw got her item out of order. So if we come back into session oh, yeah. and we'll take it up at the end. Mm -hmm. There's another one that we might have to take up out of order that the managers asked me to bring up also. Thank you, Councilor Jordan. Look out so for we will be entering into executive session after we take this vote and then returning to I the airwaves, returning to a full agenda. As a, as a council after executive session. All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? We shall hey. enter executive Hello. session. Let's take Conference that. room upstairs. After the 11 o'clock deadline that we have. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules such that we will now be suspending the uh, rule that we have that we cannot take up items past 11 o'clock. And uh, I think that's being done because it's known that these are, are, are quick items that are being taken up. So all those in favor of suspending the rules? Any opposed? Passes unanimously 7 to 0. Mr. Chairman. Council Jordan. I think we should have a motion to come back into session after adjourning to executive session. So I'll make that a motion. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to come back into regular session from executive session. All those in favor? Any opposed? Shall we take the other vote we had over again then? You really need to. Yes. Okay. Uh, all, those in favor, all those in favor of suspending the rules? in order to take up items uh, past 11 o'clock. We'll move that. I move that we suspend the rules and take up 
so that we may take up items after 11 o'clock. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, we have five seconds. It passes. <laughs> <sighs> Now I know how Dick Clark feels at midnight at, at uh, Times Square. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Item number 86 is on our agenda, which is to consider proposed revisions to the pay classification plan. Any comments about this? Mr. Chairman. Council Cogso. I, I move that we um, table until the budget process the proposed revisions to the pay classification plan. I'll second that motion. It's been moved and seconded to table until the budget process. Any any discussion? Any further discussion? I guess you mean incorporated in as part of the overall yes, budget. Yes, to have it become part of the, mm -hmm. the actual budget process. Okay. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Passes unanimously seven to zero. Item 87 is to consider changing the date of the regular March Town Council meeting from Monday, March 13, 1989 to Wednesday, March 15, 1989, and take any necessary action. The reason is that this conflicts with a National League of Cities conference of which uh, at least two members, as far as I know, of the Council will be attending. I move that we change the date of the regular March uh, Town Council meeting from Monday, March 13, 1989 to Wednesday, March 15, 1989. Second motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? It passes unanimously that in March our meeting will move from Monday, March 13th to Wednesday, March 15th. Uh, I would like to again ask for a suspension of the rules so that we may take up item 88, which the manager has asked us to take up, which is uh, authorization of signature facsimile, and 89, which Councilor Greenlaw asked to be brought up earlier as well regarding I'll, me. Did you make that a follow-up? We all remember. You? I'll second it. <laughs> I certainly do. Okay, all, you, you moved, Councilor Jordan? Did you move that? Yes. It's been moved to suspend the rules to take up item 88 and 89 out of order. Seconded. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Passes unanimously. So we'll now take up item 88, which is the signature facsimile authorization. Michael? Yeah, this uh, merely allows us to use a check signature machine. Uh, it was intended from the very beginning uh, when we were switching over uh, to the manager serving as the treasurer. And I, uh, uh, Casco Bank, uh, Casco Northern Bank, rather, provided us with uh, this and what it would mean. It would be filled in so that I would be the signatory the, for the fax machine. Uh, and it would only be my signature uh, It would uh, be included on the facsimile signature machine. Any further, would someone care to make a motion or further discuss this? There's no particular problem. Uh, for example, if you are out of town, <coughs> Michael, uh, with uh, the acting town manager using that machine legally. No, I would still have the position of treasurer. Uh, that would not change. We do, we do have a deputy treasurer who's also allowed to hand sign checks mm -hmm. as well. Who is? Who is uh, Barbara Ray? Has been. Well, she was also the deputy uh, to Barbara Joy. Okay. Michael, do you, do you want a resolution? To approve the resolution is what I'm looking for. Do we have to read it? Please. Okay. I move that we approve the uh, resolution for facsimile signatures. Second. It's, it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? None. If all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Passes seven to one. I thought you were going to read that. I thought you were going to read that. <laughs> <laughs> no, read Michael. It all. No, Michael. I didn't see you. Just gave me a dirty look so that I should Councilor not. Councilor Greenlaw would like to now summarize item 89. I would like to move that we request that the Ordinance Committee investigate wording about sewer connections into wetland areas when the wastewater flows into the Northern Cape sewer system. Second. Second. We're going to second it to refer that to the Ordinance Committee. Any further discussion? Maybe, maybe I'll bring up the, the discussion now is 
What if it's in the wet? I'm kind of a little confused about it. If it's it's already built in the wetlands, right? Which which now under new construction probably couldn't have been built. Right. This is about new construction. This is only new construction. No, new, new we're talking about hooking up a building that is in a wetland, hooking up to the sewer. Okay, a new new construction. Uh -huh. But how could it be constructed if it's in a wetland? These are just. It's both wetlands and a hundred year flood, within a hundred year flood plain. Okay. And there well, are some possibilities that year. some could be within that. Yes. I suppose. Okay. Because you, you just would naturally think if it's in the wetlands, you'd probably want it to be able to be sewered. If that it was be, already. Because if it had a septic system, the septic system's gonna fail. So it's a little strange in terms of the logic if you look at it without the hundred year plane entered into it. That's what Councilor Jordan was pointing out earlier. So glad I brought it up. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion that's been moved and seconded. Oh, Councilor Jordan, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, you're, you're in favor? No, yeah, no I'm, I'm in favor, but I just want to make a comment okay. that to clarify your confusion, that it doesn't necessarily have to be a home in a wetland. It could be, the land could be such a home, it could be high enough to be out of the wetlands, and you might want to have to go through the wetlands to get the sewer. Mm. And that is what you would be possibility of looking at, and I don't. I won't get into it now, but okay. we will later. All right. So all those in favor of the motion. It passes unanimously 7 to 0. Uh, is there any other, before we adjourn, any other citizens' items, citizens' items for discussion? Anyone would like to come forward and bring forth any items? If not, is there any miscellaneous before we adjourn that a council would like to bring up? I would just remind the town council that we're having a workshop on February 6th at 7 p.m. in the basement of town hall. I would take a uh, motion to adjourn. I so moved. Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? <coughs> Any opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you for Thank staying. Thank you. Thank you for staying. Thank you. Yes. Michael. I know. Oh.